Frambro back with Grand Tactician Civil War. Union campaign, very hard difficulty in elevated aggression. In version 1.08. Union forces are on the move uh, across all the theaters. A new corps opens up a new front. The Navy is preparing to make another coastal sortie. Cadwallader and his army of the Kanama continue their advance in East Tennessee. Grant makes moves to deal with the Army of Tennessee near Nashville. McClellan confronts the Confederates besieging Fort Henry. And finally, Nathaniel Lyon resumes his offensive toward Fort Smith, Arkansas whereupon he runs into a combined rebel force twice his size. Has Lion bitten off more than he can chew? Before we get started, got a comment recently asking about building mines and suggesting, uh, yeah, I had mentioned recently in a previous episode about gold and uh, its effect. Like, I'm sure gold has an effect. I'm just not 100% sure precisely what that effect is. Does it contribute to available capital in banks? Uh, does it increase private wealth? Does it help... Uh, you know, kind of boost up credit rating, you know, bullion reserves, that sort of thing. That, that, those all sound reasonable. I just don't know in the game mechanics what gold does. Uh, I do know that the Union does not have a gold mine. So it was suggested that I build one. That, that cannot be done in Grand Tactician Civil War. Whatever the mines are, that's it. One can upgrade existing mines. That can be done. But one cannot build a new one. It's just, it's just not there. It's not in the game. Uh, and this down here at the bottom on the campaign map, this is the tab for building federal buildings. That's, you know, the military academies, the market, hospital. Um, this middle button, that's company applications. If mines were buildable, this is where it would be. The buildable uh, private companies are brickworks, farms, foundries, ironworks, lumber mills, factories, mills, plantations, and saltworks. No mining. And since I'm talking about it, this last button over here, this is the uh, this is the railroads. I used to build railroads all the time, but man, these things are just expensive as hell, and I am abs I'm just not convinced that you ever get remotely the return on investment for building them. We should get the return on investment. I just don't know if the uh, Economy is quite tuned so that we actually get the return on investment. Anyway, enough about that. Can't build mines. Let's have a look at what's going on in the various theaters. Out east. Really kind of coastal. Recently took Port Hatteras into that little saga. Battle Squadron is uh, up here just kind of recovering some, not readiness, they're at green readiness, but some condition. Uh, you know, these ships are somewhere like in the 70s. I'm going to let these come up a little bit. I'm not going to wait all the way till 100%, but uh, let's get these guys up maybe, you know, majority of these frigates into the 90s. And then the plan for Farragut is to come down here. And uh, basically try the same thing again with Fort Macon, which is a little bit more important because this fort uh, does control a port, Moorhead City. And so we're continuing the slow uh, 
effort down here along the Atlantic coast. Speaking of that, did something quite a while ago that I didn't mention. Fort Taylor. I've got like 10,000 men here. I've got four infantry brigades. And if one counts the campaign start small artillery that is just here anyway, I got three artillery units. This is enough for a very small corps, roughly, well, roughly about the same size as that Army of Kanawha in East Tennessee. So I'm going to make one. And the purpose of this, well, let's just make it. Uh, this is going to be basically an independent corps. So I'm going to detach this unit, Slocum 63rd Brigade. It should just pop right there. Yep. Army of Florida, which is a little bit of a highfalutin name. Uh, it's trying to put uh, Joseph Reynolds in there. I don't think so. I don't think so. I am thinking right. Why right? Because right is an engineer. That's why. Okay, so let's just make a little core here. Let's make, uh, so we're going to need three little divisions. I don't know if I actually need the divisions because I don't intend for this unit to do any tactical fighting. But hey, why not? Let's get Slocum in here. Transfer. Uh, I'm going to need the garrisons here. And I think for whatever this is, ought to be pretty close. Yeah, pretty close to the front of the queue. I'm even going to take these uh, these few guns here from the Fort Taylor Garrison. Not even going to bother renaming them, though. They can stay the Fort Taylor Garrison. I did give them... I don't know if the infantry's weapons matter for besieging a fort. But in case they do, I've gone ahead and given these guys Springfield rifle muskets. I, I gave them to them a long time ago when I still had a bunch. <laughs> they still have them. Uh, and, and I gave them rifled artillery. And then this little garrison unit that I'm taking along with, uh, I didn't have any. I at least gave them 12-pounder field guns, not the 6-pounder field guns they had before. We've got an engineer in command. Uh, Army of Florida is a little bit high pollutant. I think we're up to 11th Corps. Okay. Turchin, not a bad commander, but he's an infantry guy. I kind of want to get artillery and engineers into this particular Let's find an arty guy for the arty division. Colonel Jefferson C. Davis. Real dude. Rather unfortunately named. <laughs> for his, uh, you know, for a Union general. And let's get a couple engineers here in command of these divisions. Like, say, sort by leadership. Governor Moore is not here. I know it'll have him assigned anywhere.
These two guys look all right. Ronald McKenzie. And James St. Clair Morton. I'm interested to have at least uh, two stars of leadership on all these guys because morale is a significant factor in siege and the siege stuff. So let's sort uh, by leadership here. Person's pretty good for a you know for a guy out of the pool taking a new brigade. Fame ought to help with the morale. Let's do that. Okay, Blinker's all right here. And the infantry West Pointer with two stars in leadership. And the admin doesn't help, uh, doesn't hurt, rather. So, Andrew Smith, you can keep your job there. Right. So, why have I done this? Because that skull is just because I took the that garrison unit out of the fort. It shows that skull there. I don't think it's really a big deal. I do not expect the Confederacy to ever come. Oh, wait, that reminds me. I think there's also a brigade at Fort Jefferson. You know what? Let's, let's pop them on over, too. It should be there in just a... Oh, that's why... Not Morris. <laughs> Governor Warren. I had kind of pre-staged him. <laughs> Forgot about that. Let's give him Springfield rifle muskets. It's a small brigade. So what is this force for? I intend to sail them up here and take this fort. It's a tier one fort, Fort Brook. I think that'll be a good, and you know, since it's tier one, it's a good initial uh, kind of cutting their teeth to get some perks. And then that will deprive the Confederacy of the port of Tampa, which is not very big, but it's something. Once we're done with that, this fort should keep control of this port, even though, you know, we don't have a city in Florida. And then we'll come back on the sea again. Take Cedar Key, which is actually a bigger port. Or I thought it was. Now here, they're going to have to build a fort. Because as soon as they move away from it, there's nothing here to keep a zone of control on Cedar Key. So they're going to have to build a fort right here for that to stay Union when they move along. Once that's and so that's so those two projects are probably going to take up the rest of the summer for them. But once that's done, there's a couple of options. They can march up through here and actually take Jacksonville, which should deprive the Confederacy of this port at Fernandina. If that happens, well, then we shouldn't need to take Fort Clinch. That's one option. Another option is to sail over here and kind of repeat the Cedar Key thing at Apalachicola. Another option is to come up this way and capture Tallahassee. 
Now, eventually, hopefully that you can do all of these things. Just what the next move will be after Cedar Key, eh, I don't know. We'll see. The CS right now, I'm sure, other than this force here, which has actually grown a little bit, this Army of Florida, they've got several brigades here, 10,000, and it's growing a little bit more. So, But other than this force way over here at Pensacola, they don't have any troops over here, or at least I don't think they do. Once Wright starts messing around in Florida, they will probably respond to that. But I'm pretty confident he's going to at least be able to get Tampa and Cedar Key before the Confederacy really does anything. This pretty nice plantation here we'll grab as well. So that's the idea with 11th Corps. Select it here, and let's go ahead and... He's got 100% supply flow, or at least he does at the moment because I haven't advanced time yet. But there's a port right here. It's hard to see. Key West, he's, he is drawing supply, seaborne. So I think it's okay to let him sit here just a little bit, come up in readiness. We want him in green readiness before he starts a fort siege. Um, so we'll get him moving pretty soon. And we also need to give him a little bit of time for this brigade to transfer over from Fort Jefferson. Okay. In the east... It's June. We fought a big battle. The, some of these armies have been kind of beat up, but, you know, kind of the way it is uh, in the current state of the game. They're, they're recovering their readiness pretty quickly. Now, eventually, they're going to come back and they're going to try again right here in Northern Virginia. And I don't mind that. I mean, you know, our armies are growing in experience. We haven't had, you know, we've had some pretty uh, interesting battles. The last one in Virginia was pretty rough. So we're going to keep getting repeated battles. I'm interested in kind of slowly moving the location of those battles further south. Right? Richmond. So let's get the Army of the Potomac uh, kind of re- gathered here by bringing the second corps back across the river so we have all of our corps together we have finished these two forts now runyon and tompkins i've brought in some uh, I've put political officers in command of these two and i've also uh recruited some garrison brigades for them so that's kind of the outlook for Virginia. Just fought a battle here at Athens. Matter of fact, time has not advanced yet. It was actually the HQ that made the contact. The physical location on the campaign map of the Corps is back, still back up here. And I think we're going to go ahead and uh, I guess I guess Army of West Tennessee is already done retreating. It appears. I'm going to go ahead and keep pushing him on down toward Chattanooga. This point here, though, Kingston, Tennessee, this is important. Why is that important? Because this army, Army of Tennessee, has been very passive. As a matter of fact, it's been sitting here since uh, early winter, I think. We haven't actually even fought this army yet. Because it hasn't been joining in to the repeated drives in on Nashville that we've been seeing. But that's 32,000 troops. 
I haven't attacked it because if I came over and attacked it before now, under the assumption that we won the battle, the Army of Tennessee, whoever commands it, would simply retreat. And it needs a Confederate IIP to which to retreat. If I'd attacked before now, it could easily have just come back over this way to Kingston, which was Confederate at the time, and that would have gotten in the Army of Kanawha's way to come down the valley. Now, however, Kingston is Union. Shouldn't retreat this way. This IIP is Confederate right next to him, but if he loses a battle, and I don't know who he is, I don't know who commands this, if he loses a battle and goes into retreat mode, he will lose that zone of control, and Sparta will revert to whichever city under who under which influence it normally falls, which is probably Nashville, which is Union. Possibly, I think it's probably Nashville, but if it's not Nashville, then it's Knoxville, which is Union. So Sparta is going to flip Union as soon as he goes into retreat mode. He can't retreat here. The point I'm making is... Now we're in a situation where the Army of Tennessee would be forced to retreat away and not interfere with what's going on in East Tennessee, which I thought, if I attacked them before now, might have. And there's no IPs up in here that are Confederate either. Let me show the front line for a second. Yeah. He's kind of up here in a cul-de-sac, and he's going to lose this IP. Can't go this way. Can't go north. There's, there's nothing up here for him to retreat to. He's got to go south, possibly to Chattanooga or one of these IPs down here, possibly only as far as the Army of the Oconee, but that's still, that's away from East Tennessee. So I'm, and there's 30 something thousand troops here. Army of the Oconee is possibly close enough to reinforce. So we got to figure 40,000 troops as a possibility, not a certainty. Grant has almost 50,000 if we include the cab, right? So, but one of his corps is over here. So we need to get 5th Corps back over here to Nashville, and then Grant is going to move on the Army of Tennessee. There's some risk in that. Get the, let me get these uh, movement orders over here. Let's get the cab over here. Fremont and Sherman. Let's get Sherman right about here. Eh, that may actually count as river. Reposition that. <laughs> That's fine. We'll let him take the river. That'll be faster for him, I think. The risk is that we're leaving, we got a siege going on here, and that leaves McClellan's Army of the Mississippi already involved in the siege at Fort Henry. Basically, on, on their own against one, two, three, four, five Confederate forces. And if these forces were to come over here and join the siege of Fort Henry, yeah, I, I don't think that would go very well for us. But I'm taking the risk because I don't think it's very easy for these uh, forces to get to Fort Henry Siege because Fort Hyman is in the way. This fort is not besieged. Their route to come join this siege necessarily puts them in contact with Fort Hyman first. So I'm not sure they can get these guys into this particular siege. And the siege itself is in our favor at the moment. 
helped by the fact that Sixth Corps under Stevens has got uh, Siege Perk. So that helps. So I'm going to let this percolate for now. The morale situation in both of these corps looks fine. At the moment, we've got more troops than the Confederates. And then one could also make the argument that converting this into a tactical battle now before these guys could uh, reinforce is also a viable action. And I may wind up doing that, but I'm not going to do it right this moment. Oh, one other small thing that I saw that I thought was interesting. If you look at these perk effects, so we're getting the benefit of the siege train. Look at the perk effects that the Confederates have uh, benefit of. Both of them have embedded reporters. I don't know if that would be my first choice. It's not a bad perk. I use it sometimes. Fame helps. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that perk is apparently in play. It's a factor in this battle. And what I find interesting about that is, so if you look at, I can't show it right now because I don't have an open perk slot to bring up the bar with the tooltips, but this particular perk is leveled up by fighting battles. So it makes sense that it is at play here. It's just, it wasn't completely clear, at least it wasn't completely clear to me, if that meant it could only be leveled up in tactical battles. And the fact that it's here is, to me, confirmation that, no, siege battles against forts or just, you know, siege battles in general between armies and probably auto-resolve battles uh, also will level up the embedded reporter's uh, perk. Okay, so that's kind of the plan on <clears throat> what should be happening in Tennessee over the near term. Then finally, over here in Arkansas, we've got orders for 7th, no, not, should be 8th Corps, uh, coming down and continuing the push toward Fort Smith, and they're going to have to fight these uh, two armies again. Let's see what their strength is. Army of the West. Army of the West has been reinforced. They were much lower than this. This is a 9,500 army at the moment, projected to increase to 13,000. And Army of Arkansas, 8,000. Okay, this combined force, even now, is bigger than the Army of the Missouri and is going to get even a little bit bigger than that. Uh, Lion has currently got not quite 17,000. So these two combined armies at the moment have about 2,000 more men than Lion does. And pretty soon are going to have about 6,000 more men. He does have an artillery advantage, and he's got a, you know, he's got an experience, uh, a quality advantage too. This army has seen a couple battles. They've gotten a little bit of experience. They're all rifle armed. Their artillery is rifled. We're going to continue with this plan, but pretty soon we're going to be fighting some outnumbered battles over here. So that'll be interesting. Okay, I've talked enough. I think it's time to get time rolling. Now this damn army is coming back up toward us. 
apparently ghosting what? Rear guard action. Just flip right on by. So that was his rear guard action, I guess. Yeah, okay. So what's happening here is following that defeat at Athens, rather than come back down here to one of these IPs or to Chattanooga, he's retreating to Sparta. Okay, so there's good and bad in that. The bad is that Although they're kind of on their butt at the moment, that is another 10,000 troops that Grant has to deal with over here in this plan movement. The good is that, hey, he left Chattanooga completely open for Ninth Corps and, you know, the Army of the Kanawha. So, yeah, I'll go grab that. And here we go. We've got... Ooh. Yeah, we've got 14,000 infantry. Well, here we go. 16,000, almost, we'll call it 17,000 men. Against more than that. Depending on how the, uh, the battle, you know, defensive versus offensive, uh, engineering points, terrain, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. This could turn into a pretty rough battle. So, should be pretty interesting. Let's see what happens. We're on the Peat Ridge map. The good news is... It's a defensive situation... With terrain that is well suited to defense. I mean, this map is almost 100% forest. The bad news is, because of that same terrain, our, our one material advantage, artillery, is just not going to be much of a factor here. There, there's no way around that. Um, so, here's the two objectives that we're defending. The Confederates are spawning in down here at this road. They got to come through Brightwater. This is the only road that comes up, right? So this is not much of a guessing game on where they're going to be coming from. Once they get up in here, what they do uh, upon arrival is a little bit of a guessing game. This is the defensive position I've set up. I've got a parapet here. Uh, and it is reinforced. This is intended to be the main line. I don't have everybody in it right now. Once they come up into here, Cav is here to spot their initial approach and see if they continue on this way or take this left turn and come down toward the objectives like so. Which normally they would. Here's where the objectives are. But in this case, you know, we've got these parapets here. They may decide to come and flank this way. There are two divisions in this corps that are more experienced than the others as far as tactical battles. McCall's second division and Sweeney's first division. So all of these brigades here already have their perp. Haskell's division is a little bit newer. They don't have the first combat. They, yeah. They don't have the first combat modifier. Because I think we've done some auto-resolve stuff, or maybe they were there for the first try at uh, Fort Smith. I don't remember. But they do not have their perk slot open, and it's quite likely that the Confederates may try to flank one side or the other. So they're split at the moment. I don't intend for this division to be split um, once contact is made. But for the moment, this brigade is going to construct some breastworks along like so. And this one 
kind of belong in here because we may need those uh, fortifications. And that'll, that should finish up uh, opening up their perk slot as well. And then it's just going to come down to coming down, you know, hoping that our smaller force can hang on against what the Confederates bring. And this terrain and the cover, and I, I think I think they'll be okay. The artillery are wired. Uh, right now, I've uh, and I'm also utilizing this bit of fence here, and there's in right on the edge of the forest, and I've got them right in here. It's not a great arty position at all. It's just the best available under the circumstances, right? Uh, you know, they've got a little bit of a field of fire across these fields, and that's about it. And uh, even if I'm, you know, e even if I had them back a little bit, they wouldn't even be able to hit that. That's why they're right up on the line with the infantry at the moment. If the if a major assault does come through here, or the main assault, they're going to have to pull back and not be a factor in the battle anymore. And because of the uh, number dis disparity, yeah, I'm going to leverage kind of the whole skirmisher thing. i got a line of skirmishers up through here. And that's going to give the Confederates some trouble. That's the plan. We'll see how it works out. Okay, the leading elements of the Army of the Trans-Mississippi spotted. It's a pretty big cav brigade. Did come up this road, however, took off and are coming through the woods. So they're clearly wanting to load up on our right. Hicks continues building this uh, breastwork. He did pick up his ace of spades. Hazen, I've stopped him constructing, and he is coming over. We're going to have a third division here. They may possibly wind up moving over this fence. I don't know. I'm moving the artillery back to the this tree line right here since there's a, some open ground here where they may wind up having some opportunities. Morning of day two, 0500 on June 8th. And you can see the deployment zone. I had a few more points. I put some parapets over here since... Uh, we know uh, they're coming probably from this direction. Would have put them a little bit further back, but uh, the previously constructed breastworks got in the way, but I wanted parapets instead of breastworks, better cover. And uh, that's the position. We got two divisions here. And I left this division over here because there's another road, there's another objective back here, and there's more than one Confederate army. So I'm kind of thinking... I didn't want to leave this completely empty. A few skirms here, and I move the cav over here on this flank. Not going to lie, things are not looking good. This force, this is the Army of Trans-Mississippi. Trans-Mississippi, Trans-Mississippi. Yeah, they're kind of hanging out over here. They're waiting. There's other guys over here from the Army of the West. And they're headed toward our left flank, which is largely empty. Just got a lot worse. Skirmishers saw this guy first. He's trailing. Lowry's brigade. It's already all the way over here and is coming right in, and we got nothing in front of them. Already had. And over here, we have. That's interesting. Also, Army of the West. So we have brigades from the same army coming from opposite ends. We're getting thoroughly flanked. And none of these fortifications are going to matter much. And I'll also mention it's pretty much imperative that we have to inflict greater than two to one casualties. 
Otherwise, we will trigger uh, our retreat phase before they do. Why does it have to be greater than two to one at a bare minimum? Because it's about two to one, the size of the forces, right? Even if we inflict more casualties, but it's not quite two to one, our percentage of casualties will get up toward that 20, 22% uh, threshold. And that's when a retreat is forced. Right. Well, the battle's pretty much starting now. Lowry's gotten over here basically threatening our rear. I've got Sweeney's division coming over to uh, this, or Steed. I don't know. Where is he? Where's Sweeney? Anyway, I have this division coming to this position here. Cav has run over here as a stopgap. Got uh, Hazen's infantry here kind of protecting the artillery. Against Pike's Brigade coming in. This force is still, you know, in the parapets facing the Army of the Trans Mississippi. Hicks will probably have to flex back over this way, though. Hazen engaged. Let's get some of this artillery out facing down that road. Killer commander over close to his battalions. Let's rotate this artillery this way for whatever good it will do. Yeah. By the way, this guy built breastworks so fast in this particular battle, he's he's got his unique flag. <laughs> he's got engineering three. So they're engineers, though, you know? That doesn't mean that they're an elite unit. Okay, some infantry is starting to press over here. Well, we just kind of came over here and stopped. So this infantry is getting in position over here in time. Okay, this is the more troubling uh, attack over here. Hazen does have some cover. He built enough breathworks here on this side. Time. Okay, Pike falling back, but we've got Finnegan coming in here. Doing that weird little ball up thing that units sometimes do. They're coming up real close though. That tells me that they've got smooth bores. The courier coming from somewhere to who, I don't know. I thought that was a Confederate courier, which would indicate that the Army of the West HQ, or this guy's division commander, is up here somewhere. No, his division commander's here. Oh, no. Well, those guys got routed fairly easily. What's their morale situation? 50? Which is 57? It's not super low. Somebody just got wounded. The yard. That's the, I think that's the calf commander. What's going on over here? They're engaged with infantry. That's what's going on over here. I mean, they're not taking heavy losses yet. Infantry has come up. They're joining in. They're okay. The yard just got a little unlucky there. This is California Cavalry, by the way, and they have more carbines. Leave us. Uh, is this? Uh, just leave Sturgis as kind of a reserve at the moment. I have a funny feeling it's going to be needed elsewhere pretty fast. Amazing, how you doing? It's taking 200 casualties. It's doing okay. These guys are close enough for getting a little bit of forest cover, though. This isn't really developing over here. Let's 
give Hips uh, double time as well. There's some horse artillery coming up. Is that that? Is that that big? Uh, I can't. I can't get the tooltip to expand while he's moving. But I think he's probably got like a billion uh, guns in there. Okay. This infantry has been seen off. That was Lowry. And looks like we might have some exposed artillery there. Let's push this cab up to uh, pop this arty. Given the fact that these were Army of the West units, these are Army of the West units, that kind of tells me that on, you know, that, is, that tells me that out here in the fog, there may not be a lot of Confederate units coming up behind these. It looks like divisions that were way separated. Okay, Hicks helping out some flanking fire. These guys are wavering too. That's some skirms coming in there. That's not a huge deal. Come on, Hicks, get down here. Let's let's see these. Let's get rid of these guys. Melee. Unfortunate. Don't really want that. The problem with the melee is, and we saw this in a previous episode, once they go into melee, it can be hard to get them out. You can give them orders, you can move them elsewhere on the battlefield, you can and they'll fire at other units, but you but they stay in melee. Which in turn impacts the you know, it's it's kind of a bug. It hangs up. Which means that they cannot recover fatigue. Which they're not in a bad fatigue situation. Right? See, he's not actually firing. Come on, up. Maybe you can chase him down. Paying too much attention to that and not other parts of the battlefield. It picks up. Go ahead and come out of this breastwork over here. Let's get this artillery unit out of here. If he's going to be in melee anyway, let's put him in melee. Just charge those guys then. Hopefully. As they have to cross half constructed breastworks on their charge. These guys have been pushed back. So let's rotate Hicks, get him back in his defensive position. What the hell is this brigade doing? Turn initiative off. Andrews. Stop. Decided to take it upon himself to come over and help this flank, which I really didn't want him to do. K, 
Okay, 1,500 to 500. The ratio is perfect. And actually, look at that morale drop. We've routed enough units that their morale has dropped to 36. And... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was worried earlier. Turns out I may have been... Okay, we've got some units coming this way. This doesn't seem to be a threat over here anymore. Okay, that's routed. Good. They're not fully routed. Still shown in melee. You want to go charge them again then? Get some prisoners. Okay, let's rotate this infantry back around. And we'll get them back up to this defensive line here. And we'll get Andrews back over where he's supposed to be. One would hope. This isn't over. But it's gone better than I thought it would. Help. Heck, let's... Uh, Let's use some of these Confederate guns here. Let's get Hicks back up in its position. Let's get Andrews back up in his position. These skirms here have been driven back. We had a skirm line all through here. They've all been driven back. So this army of Trans-Mississippi may be making a, an assault here pretty soon. Bring Hazen up to here. This is the second time we've seen so, uh, a brigade. We, we had this a couple battles ago. We, the second time we've seen a brigade ordered to take over some guns, and they send, like, a skirm line to it, but they don't actually take uh, possession of the guns. That might be because he already had some skirms out elsewhere, perhaps. So if we hold all those skirms in, now let's see if he'll do it. There we go. Okay. I think it's because he had storms out elsewhere that I have forgotten about. It's working. Okay. Andrews got back up into line in time. Nice job, Andrews. Sort of. I mean, nice job recovering from your undesired behavior earlier. We've got a uh, long brigade coming in. Looks like they want to do some melee. Kind of what it looks like. I don't think it's going to turn out well for him. He's come in closer than smoothbore range should require. Yeah, they're gone. No, don't come out of the... even turned Andrew's initiative off, and he's still rotated. Okay. Hicks. Back into the trench. I believe they are already withdrawing. 8% casualties. So basically, this is a morale retreat, not a casualty retreat. And there is no feasible way we could even get remotely close to above 20% for a major victory. I'm just going to let him go. All right. Well, that battle looked scary. 
both in where we saw forces coming from and just the sheer number of Confederates on the field compared to us. Yes, we had parapets, defending situation, but they essentially flanked the fortifications. You know, we had guys fighting over here without uh, any cover other than the forest, you know, terrain cover that they would have had anyway. And over on this side, managed to get a few breastworks up. Parapets weren't really a factor over here. Other than the presence of the parapets, probably prevented the, these forces in this area maybe from making an advance er, earlier than they did. Well, it turned out not to be um, that challenging. I think there's good and bad with the AI here. You know, I mean, they did a great job of flanking, right? And units from one army coming in on opposite ends. I don't know if I've seen that before. Not not that widely separated. So that was interesting. Whether that's what they were trying to do or if it was just kind of a pathfinding thing that worked out that way, I don't know. But it looked pretty scary at the time. Once realized they were from the same army, and the individual CSA armies aren't that big. It was just we had three of them together. You know, then it was like, oh, well, you know, there's not more guys coming behind them. What we see is pretty much all there is on each individual little action over here. The main thing that I think I'm... Uh, most disappointed in is this. They had enough units. They should have given us a very rough time. We saw units from the Army of the Trans-Mississippi. That was this clump over here, the first guys we saw. And then we had units from the Army of the West who came in on opposite ends. Right, It was that army that delivered both flank attacks. And Army of the West is the largest of the three CSA armies involved. This Trans-Mississippi one was the smallest. But that largest army, of course, was spread out on both ends. And then their cav, I think Claiborne. Yeah, and then his cav was sitting kind of up here. So that army was kind of dissipated. The smallest army was kind of stymied by our position here. Didn't do much until the end when it was too late. What we did not see was any unit attached to the Army of Arkansas, which would have added another 9,000 men. And with the way things were going, we had troops here, we had troops here. And here, big, enormous hole all through here. The Army of Arkansas could have walked through and gotten, and that would have been a mess. But none of those units even got close enough to be spotted, let alone engage. So they've made improvements to the, to the AI uh, in recent weeks with recent patches, but I you know, it's an ongoing process. They still have more work to do. And they've said that they're going to. Um, 1.08, of course, just went live. And they've already made mention of an upcoming 1.09. And specifically mentioned continuing AI improvements. All right, enough said about that. Uh, 2,500 casualties overall inflicted, so no individual unit, you know, uh, nobody did a 1,000 casualties inflicted or anything. The two brigades, which did the most, at about 500 apiece, were Hazen, which makes sense, right? He was over here defending the artillery on this breastwork and engaged two infantry brigades and an artillery battalion right along in here. The other, though, was uh, 
Andrews? Somehow uh, this brigade, this, these were the guys who pulled out a line for some reason and had to turn them around and get them back in. They did 500 as well, which kind of surprised me a little bit. All right. End of day, they should be withdrawing, withdraw. Lost 30 guns. We did lose one. I guess some of the artillery probably got shot at a little bit. This says 2,700 Confederate casualties, and we lost a little over 600. Minor victory. And that's about all there is to that, the Battle of Fayetteville. Okay, fairly small numbers here, and it was a fairly small battle in the grand scheme of things. Nobody got any fame. Uh, a little over a thousand small arms, twelve artillery. I'm sure this is smooth bore, six pound field gun stuff, and a few more guys headed up to Camp Chase. I think what I was trying to do was to get Ninth Corps down to Chattanooga and start capturing that. Let's bring the Army HQ down a little bit closer. Looks like we've probably lost sight of the Army of West Tennessee, but they're almost certainly coming here or here. Still got... No! No! Okay, that plan went to hell. <laughs> because uh, I told Sherman to get on the river to move over. And in so doing, he marched just close enough to get involved in this siege. So... This plan over here is on hold until this siege is resolved. Which shouldn't be an issue is if we've got another core involved. Yeah, it's close to being resolved, or we could just assault it. And, uh... I mean, we've got 50,000 men here. Let's see if, uh... Eleventh Corps. Do they have their extra brigade yet? They do. Are they at green readiness? They are not. He does have hundred percent supply flow, so he's got all of it. You know, he's got his ammo and forge and everything. I just want him to come up in readiness for heading up to Tampa. All right. So the fact that. You know, we won a pretty nice little victory here. Doesn't change the fact that there's still a lot more Confederates here than we have in our army. However, they're going to be retreating. And clearly they've got morale issues in these armies uh, based on things that occurred during that battle. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep pushing here. And my hope, my intent, is to get down here, besiege Assault Fort Smith. Where these armies can really And if we keep moving if we keep moving maybe we can keep them in rear guard action. Make them keep retreating. As a matter of fact, I am going to go ahead and force to march, which is something I rarely do. All right, let's just see how this plays out real quick. Oh, well, okay. Fort Henry resolved. A field... Almost a hundred percent sure that this battle is going to result in 
either an immediate or a very early withdrawal by the Army of the West. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to play that on camera unless it turns out, you know, I'll hit the record button and go, oh, this is turning into a bigger battle than I thought. But I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and so I'm going to do that off camera between episodes. As far as this episode, I think that will do. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like this content, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. If you want to catch other episodes in this series that you may not have seen, I'm linking the playlist here. At any rate, thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.